Hello, hello. Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, you know, having, having a lot of fun out here so far. That's awesome. Well, I'm Mike Bloom. Nice yeah. to meet you representing a parade in RHAP. Who may I have the pleasure of speaking with today? Uh, my name is Brando. Um, I'm originally from uh, Oak Park, California, and uh, I'm 22 also, if you can't tell. You know, a lot of people think that I'm like a teenager. My my optometrist thought I was 12 the last time I went. So, uh, you know, and, and I never know what I'm going to get. <laughs> When's the last time you went to the optometrist? You know, you would think that it was like years ago. I would say maybe like six months. We're talking 2022. And uh, I know I was just as shocked as you. It was like 12? I mean, I know I don't got any like facial hair going on, but you got to give me some credit. <laughs> maybe he needs his eyes checked, ironically enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, Br Brando, what brings you out to Survivor? What makes you want to feel like your brand, in a manner of speaking, is this game? Right. Um, you know, growing up for me, uh, I always had a lot of struggles with my, you know, internal like confidence and uh, just like the way that I felt about myself. And mm -hmm. so for me, being out here is sort of proving to that younger version of me that, you know, we can make it out here and that I can, you know, push through this and, and be that person that walks home with the million dollars. Um, you know, I grew up, uh, I'm, I'm half Japanese and half white. And so I had a big struggle with always feeling like I was too white for the Asian kids and I was too Asian for the white kids. And then, uh. you know, turn on the TV and it'd be like Disney Channel, Nickelodeon, all of these shows didn't really have people that were like me. And so I think part of why I turned to, you know, Survivor was because we had people like, you know, Yao Man and Tai. And it was really cool to see people that were, you know, more like me. And there's still a degree of me that was like, you know, I'm, I'm not nearly as Asian as any of these people who are, you know, first generation. They immigrated mm -hmm. to America. And so, you know, being here is, for me is like, you know, that I can represent my own group. Yeah. So, I mean, you invoke some of those names of Survivor's past. Give me your history with the show. When did you start getting into it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my parents first showed me Survivor when um, Survivor Nicaragua was airing. And, you know, I don't know if it was like Fabio's luscious hair or the crush <laughs> that I had on Brenda, but, you know, I was instantly hooked. Um, and ever since then, you know, it's been like my thing with them. We always watch together, even when I was away at college or now that I'm, you know, moving, uh, I moved over a thousand miles away from home. And wow. every Wednesday night, you know, we boot up FaceTime, we watch the show together, we debate our draft picks in between the commercials. And so, um, you know, it's been a big family thing for me. Yeah. So that being said, can you give me one Survivor winner and one non-winner that you identify with the most? Definitely. So uh, non-winner, I already name dropped. Uh, that's got to be Yao Man for me. Um, you know, there's just something about how he's, you know, super friendly and charming, but also, you know, strategic and innovative. Like if mm. you look at, you know, he used the truck for strategy or uh, he created the first fake hidden immunity idol. You know, I think there are so many great qualities to him and uh, I'd really like to play like him. And then for winner, I think that I would be um, sort of like a mix between like, you know, if, if Yule and Cochran ran away one summer and, and had a child, I think that child would be me. <laughs> Um, wow. Because I love, <laughs> um, you know, Yule's got like that calm, cool collectiveness to him and he's really smart and always thinking. And then, you know, there's someone like Cochran who's a little bit more goofy, but still on the smarter side. And uh, I think that, you know, the, the best of both worlds for both of them is uh, what I'm looking to bring to the table. Hang on, I'm just going to like control F all fan fiction to see if the Cochran Yule <laughs> summer fling fan fiction is a thing yet. Oh, it's got to be out there somewhere. <laughs> What is your favorite moment in Survivor history? Does it involve any of those contestants that you just mentioned? Um, you know, one of my favorite moments is definitely uh, in Survivor 26 when Cochran's walking around the beach uh, beginning of the season and he's got that horrible sunburn <laughs> all over his body. You know, I, I've always been a, a fan of the goofier moments. And I think a more recent one for me is um, when there was an immunity challenge in season 42. I think it was an immunity challenge. Might have been a reward where Marianne was in this wheel spinning, yes. spinning, spinning. And when she got dizzy, she spun the other way to, to make herself undizzy. And that was like a moment where I stood up and pointed at the TV. And I was like, that's me, because that's something that I've done ever since I was little. And I'll stand by it. That 100% works. So that being said, I suppose, besides, you know, spinning in circles and reverse uh, to prepare yourself for that particular challenge, what has your prep been like for this experience? Yeah. Once you find out that you're coming out here to play, what has the work been for the months leading up to this? Right, right. So, uh, you know, I don't have a 3D printer in my apartment. So, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of my work with, uh, you know, practicing puzzles was running down to CVS, printing them out, 
uh, cutting out the pieces and making sure that I could get as many as possible. I mean, you know, the shotgun approach. Mm. Um, and so I think that that'll be a, a big factor in the way that I succeed in this game, because as, you know, 22 year old scrawny Asian guy, I think it's pretty obvious that I'm going to be put on some of the puzzles. Yeah. Talk to me about that perception. I mean, obviously besides those biases, when you hit that beach, how do you think people are going to look at you initially? Right, right. So I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who underestimate me because they think, oh, he's just some young guy. And people under the age of 25 don't really win Survivor. They don't do well. Um, but as someone who loves numbers and loves statistics, uh, one of the stats that I researched recently is that players under the age of 25, on average, outlast exactly 50% of their opponents, which oh. means, you know, when I'm coming out here, I've got just as good of a chance as anybody else to make it far in this game. Um, and so I think that's one perception that people will have of me and they won't realize what's coming at them. Yeah. So I was going to say, are you going to try to swerve into that perception? Almost like, you know, the Fabio that brought you into the show in the first place of like, yeah, I'm just a young kid. <laughs> trust in me. And then, you know, don't disregard me until day 26 when you give me a million dollars. Right. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, uh, one of my favorite things is telling puns. I'm like a big pun guy. Love and it. so I think that's something that, you know, will help disarm me a little bit because, you know, as someone who wears glasses, who is Asian, there's going to be that perception that I'm always thinking and that I'm super smart and strategic, which I mean, I am those things, but uh, if I can show my goofier side, I think that that'll help uh, make people a little less alerted. What's one life experience that you feel like has most prepared you for this game? Um, I think the biggest one for me is when I was 16 years old, um, I was about five foot eight, almost 200 pounds. And I was really unhappy with the way that I looked, but also just like, you know, the way that I felt in day-to-day -day life. And, um, you know, as a 16 year old, that's not really something that I felt like I could go out there and talk to people about and work through. And so uh, I decided one day that, you know, I was tired of, you know, just sitting around and not doing anything. And I needed to put myself out there. And that turning point for me was when Millennials vs. Gen X was airing. And, you know, David Wright was out there on the beaches of Fiji, the same beaches here. And, uh, you know, he was facing his fear of, you know, death in the outdoors and just, you know, being himself, putting himself out there. And um, that was like a big confidence booster for me. And so, you know, that year I decided that I was going to run three miles every night. I hit the ground running. And within a year, I lost over 50 pounds. And so I think, you know, that's a big point in my life. Yeah, that like, you know, it boosted my confidence, my motivation. And uh, I think that's something that's really going to drive me out here. That is incredible. Congratulations on that progress and that motivation. <laughs> now, sort of, I guess, skewing more so to the game side of things. I know in this little blurb that you right. wrote beforehand that your friends would describe you as a lovable liar. <laughs> I am so intrigued by this turn of phrase. <laughs> How is this like almost scoundrel-esque aspect going to apply for you in the game of Survivor? Right. So, um, you know, one of the things that I love doing with my friends is just screwing with them in any way that I can imagine. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I used to bring a box of, of fresh pencils to class and try to stick them into the backpack of the person in front of me, see how many I could get before they would notice. Um, and, you know, uh, along those same lines, uh, I love lying to my friends just for absolutely no reason. They'll be like, oh, hey, did you hear that, you know, this celebrity just got, uh, you know, this celebrity just passed away or this celebrity just won some crazy award. And, you know, I, I always tell them right away that it was a lie, but uh, I think that they always have fun, uh, you know, falling for my tricks for a little bit. So when it comes to seeking out people in an alliance in this game, like, are you looking for that similar joviality, someone that you could stick pencils in their pockets or stick votes in an urn for? <laughs> Uh, you know, I think that'll definitely come naturally. Um, but one of the things that I'm going to go out of my way for is somebody who, you know, isn't that much like me and might pick up the pieces that I miss. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who's, you know, very strategic, but also small and a little bit, you know, a little bit scrawnier, I think that uh, a larger, beefier player, you know, maybe more physical might be someone that could help me or someone who might have more social experience in their day to day lives might be someone that could also help me advance. So I'm going to be paying attention to the people that uh, that can pick up what I'm missing. So speaking of paying attention, I would imagine that you are paying attention to your surroundings right here, right now, right? Looking at all the other people around you. Obviously, right. you can't speak, but I'm sure you're making first impressions just as they are of you. Describe to me, is there anybody out here right now who you are sort of just based on vibes feel like, okay, this is someone that if we draw the same buff I want to work with? Is there somebody that on the other side of things like, red flag if i get the chance to i want to write their name down asap is there anyone in particular you have that vibe oh, with oh right yeah, now definitely. 
Yeah, there's a there's a handful of both. Um, I think that one person who uh, probably is getting name dropped a lot in here and that I'd really like to work with uh, is the big bald man, Bruce. Um, you know, he's someone who uh, seems really friendly and he gives me a lot of the same vibes that my dad gives me. And so I think he's someone that if he's on my tribe, you know, maybe he could be like that little piece from home. Um, there's also somebody out here who's got like some poofy hair. Uh, he's got some facial hair, got like this cool walk that he does sometimes when he knows that people are watching him. And, uh, you know, he's always making eye contact with me, always smiling at me. And, you know, the more that I, I was taking that in and feeling like I was his person, I realized, you know, he's doing that to every single person out here. And, uh, you know, he's someone that's going to be high on my radar because, I mean, he could already be everybody's number one. Um, mm. There's also, I mean, even just like going back to the airport, there was this one girl that I noticed uh, skipped every single escalator. And I don't know why, but there was just something that that made me not trust her because of that. <laughs> <laughs> like no you i don't trust the machines i'm gonna take the yeah, stairs you're like got the stands. interesting yeah so that's like listen judgments can be cast to the, to the smallest right, thing right right like, it's the, like the, what kind of world are you in where you can trust them you know <laughs> let me lay out a couple of scenarios for you here so let's say <laughs> you're on your tribe pre-merge boat pulls up to camp guy steps out okay. among your tribe okay. you got to pick one person to go on a journey now we know these things can come with good things, can come with bad things. How are you approaching this? Are you volunteering? Are you going to try to like will someone else to go on for you? What's your strategy for this? Um, I want to be honest, there's no chance that I'm volunteering for something like that in the first few days because, uh, you know, knowing that I'm not the most physical guy, if we go to a tribal council, uh, my vote's going to be really important for me since, you know, the new era, there seems to be a lot of focus on the stronger people making it through those early votes. So uh, when it comes down to a boat, either, you know, I'll let someone else take it or uh, maybe we'll draw rocks and I'll just hope for the best. Does that apply to like the general hunts for advantages? Because I mean, you're watching in this most recent season, right? This idea of like, hey, maybe even the idols that you pick up might not even be real idols. Does that also affect the way that you're approaching the hunt for other trinkets in the jungle? <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, it's terrifying. And it's definitely something they have to be thinking about because, you know, even though uh, we didn't really see any beware advantages in the last season, or at least as far as we're aware out here, um, you know, it, it's something that if I see that, you know, I'm going to try to coerce somebody else to go pick that up because uh, having the advantage isn't always the advantage. Sometimes having the knowledge of it is better. I mean, hence the knowledge is power. What would <laughs> you say is your hottest survivor take? What do you think is your most controversial opinion on a player or a season or the show in general? Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, my, my hottest survivor take is definitely a pretty hot one. And it's that uh, Edge of Extinction is actually a really fun twist. Um, you know, as someone who loves seeing players get second chances and loves the dynamic of having to, you know, work through, okay, how do we treat people when we vote them out? And, you know, how do we treat them before we vote them out? Um, I think that it's really fun to see uh, players have a chance to, you know, win their way back into the game. And maybe that maybe that spurs from me starting right around when, uh, you know, Redemption Island was airing. Well, I was going to say, or is it just you as a player trying to manifest this thing happening that like Jess <laughs> right, was hanging out right. the call and he's like, this, we should bring this back to let Brando last a full 26 days in the game some way. <laughs> please, please have that boat waiting for me to take me to Edge of Extinction <laughs> if I get <laughs> Well, last thing I got to ask is uh, maybe a site that's more welcome than a boat to edge of extinction. If you could pick a celebrity or a fictional character to come out as a loved one for your loved one's visit, who are you picking and why? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this question. And, uh, you know, I think I'm going to have to go with Ichiro Suzuki. Um, growing up, he was my favorite baseball player. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he uh, I'm pretty sure he was the first Japanese born player to be a position player in the MLB. And so, you know, something about him breaking that boundary, but also being super humble about it all the time is, is something that, you know, I really value in him. And I think he'd have a lot of good knowledge to share. Are you a Mariners fan or are you just a fan of Suzuki? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I was a big fan of him when I was growing up. But then uh, recently I moved to Seattle where I work uh, as a software developer for, you know, big tech company. And so uh, I, I've been loving going to the Mariners games, especially last season where uh, yeah. you know, they finally made it to the playoffs. Yeah, the last time before last season that they were in the playoffs, I was one. So it was nice to finally get to, you know, experience that during my lifetime. Look at us. Who would have thought? What's up? How are oh, you like doing, man? Well, like I best, man. <laughs> I mean, listen, deja vu, I think, would be putting it mildly. I'm sure you're experiencing it yourself. How's everything going right now for you? 
everything's going awesome. It's uh, yes, a definite case of deja vu. Um, I've walked these paths and I've, you know, walked over these little train tracks and, you know, looked up to make sure a coconut doesn't fall on me. Like I've done all of this already. It's like, it's in and sleep in a tent city. I've done it all. Like it's, it is ultimate deja vu. Yeah. So I guess to start, you know, Obviously, it's only been just about a year uh, or even less than that since everything went down in 44. How has your life sort of changed or has there been no no relative change for you? Is it just sort of like same Bruce, different season as you were approaching your second time out on Survivor here? Um, th there has been a lot of change, uh, which is a, a good thing, a sad thing. But there there has been a lot of change. Um, but the biggest part of it all with all the change that happened is that, you know, definitely not taking anything for granted, not a single day will go by that I'll take for granted. I'm going to have a damn good time. Um, whether it be sitting in an office, you know, getting some paperwork done or, or hanging out on an Island, you know, with a bunch of other castaways, just chilling. Yeah. So I'm really intrigued as to the process that got you here for this specific season, because we were all there, right? And you found out alongside us that right after the premiere episode, where we see, you know, your, your medevac, your tenure in the game being the shortest in Survivor history, that Jeff says, yeah, Bruce, open invite to come on whenever you want. And you talked to me a bit about, right, like hearing that back after the fact. Talk to me about what the timeline was from then until now, because like I'm looking at my watch, it was a relatively short period of time since then. Yeah, the, t the timeline was like quantum leap. It was it was quick. It was <laughs> really quick. Um, the day after I actually the day I spoke to you later on that day, I had my conversation um, with Jeff uh, with casting to be able to say, okay, what are we going to do? Do you want now or do you want to wait? And you know, in the back of my mind, like, wait a minute, there's some there's some really good momentum going on right now in regards to you know Survivor and the love that I got from everyone, um, you know, the well wishes. So I'm like, you know what? Why not? Why not now? Um, so I said yes at that point before even checking in with the wife. <laughs> and she literally, when I when I did tell my wife, she's like, oh my God, yes. Oh my, go have some fun. I was like, yeah, let's go. So um, so yeah, we we I found out, you know, the the night of the episode, and then I the decision was made the following day just to start the process and going out. So when it comes to that process, because from a prep perspective, you could go in a couple different directions, right? You could be, well, I went through all this stuff a year ago. I can just do the same exact thing. Or you're like, I do have 12 hours of Survivor under my belt. Let me prepare differently. Which path have you ultimately taken in terms of like your prep during this very truncated timeline? Okay, so the 12 hours of prep that I had was really not 12 hours or 12 hours of showtime. Yes, it was 12 hours of showtime. Um, someone that I know keeps telling me it was 10, but you know, well, I'll talk to him <laughs> later. Uh, <laughs> but the 12 hours, that there was nothing of me playing Survivor. There was nothing. Like I I hit my head and I just was not around, like mentally was not there to mm -hmm. be able to, to to honestly feel like I played the game. Um and then as far as for what I needed to do with it being kind of old hat that, you know, I knew that all I needed to do was speak to, you know, the proper people, get the time that I needed, and then, you know, make sure that certain things were, were where they needed to be by way of my family, by way of, you know, financial, and then that's it. Boom, I'm, I'm out here. Like, it was, it was you know, I'm, I'm old hat now. It's like, like riding a bike. <laughs> it was easy. <laughs> yeah. So when it comes to that, I mean, like you said, you know, you sort of don't even define your survivor experience by survivor in general, but like, is there something you learned out here your first time around that you really are like putting in your pocket and moving forward with, be it from like a game perspective, a production perspective, et cetera, that you're hoping will make you a little bit more, you know, quick on the uptake when you start your second season here? Um, You know, it's... Uh... As far as the production side, the, the beginning parts, the only uh, the only edge up that I have on these other contestants is everything's hurry up and wait. And when I was in the military, that was a slogan, hurry up and wait. So mm -hmm. I'm cool with that. I have no problem at all. But as far as for being out there with the contestants and, and starting the game, there is something that I will have above them, which is just the ability to... to know firsthand on what what has taken place on 44 and how how the dynamics really really work out 
we see television. Television's awesome. Splice, cut, dropped on the floor, like all that other good stuff. And it's made into a, a story. There's so much more that's there that people, that these young people, and I say young people, because I'm, I'm like an ancient man. I'm 47. I'm 46. I'll be 47 in August. Like, I feel old as hell. Um, but these people, they'll understand it. They'll see it. And they're going to be like, okay, well, you know, this is not what happened on TV. And I'm going to be like, oh, no, it's not. And oh, no. Well, what do you want to do about that? You know, yeah, and that, that's how I'm going to grab it. It's such an interesting perspective because, yeah, I mean, to your point, again, your your experience was very unique. But, like, you did get to experience people coming in through Ponderosa and obviously, like, getting to talk with your cast and hear about their experiences like you essentially got to secondhandedly experience a survivor season and so I do think it's interesting how yes from like an actual time play perspective you only have a small leg up on these 45 contestants but at the same time you do certainly have like a perspective of being able to you know talk to other people that played large roles in the rest of the season exactly exactly you know and you know i was they always have the, the the mayor of ponderosa you know first person voted off now nah, hell no i was the king of ponderosa okay? <laughs> i was the king of ponderosa so when i get, and it was so funny because this is how much this is how much like people don't understand the perspective of, of the people that are being voted off they came to ponderosa and the way that it worked out was i would greet them and then they'd go down the line to whoever else was next and they would always ask me every single person how's your head I'm like, I'm like, this isn't about me. It's about you. You just got voted out of the game. Like I was an ass <laughs> hat in my head <laughs> and I got myself taken out of the game. Like, like this is about you at this moment. And then that just goes to show that as, as devastated as people are, they're still conscious of everything going on around them. So when they come to Ponderosa, you know, you, they were allowed to speak their truth of what they thought happened. Mm. And then, when everything gets rewound and you see it on TV, well, now you get more of a of an honest idea of what happened, um, because the edit is close to what truly happened when it comes to being voted out of the game. Mm. So, you know, it, it's that's the perspective above and beyond that I have across this game. Do you get a sense as to if people are like recognizing you and formulating thoughts about you as as you're walking around doing all this pregame stuff? <laughs> Do you have any idea? Um, so the process is you we go to LA and we're in LA and all of a sudden we we come downstairs, we get ready to leave. So everybody's in a line. I was the second group to come downstairs. So there's already four people in line. So mm. now here comes the other four, and I'm a part of it. I'm in the elevator and people are looking at me like it's a little side eye, like, what the <laughs> is this? No, that's not. And then I'm walking down <laughs> across the lobby and then there are people that are waiting in line and they're looking at me like, oh, is that Bruce? That's gotta be Bruce. And they're like whispering, you can see it in their eyes. Like it's gotta be, and then everybody that comes through, they're looking, there was some people that would walk by me and they kind of did a little stutter step and turn and look kind of arched back a little bit like, oh my God, that, that's, that's Bruce. <laughs> so they recognize, because you know, everybody that, that applies for this game, they know the game, they've watched it. Right. And I was just on their television, you know, three and a half, four weeks ago. Yeah. So, I mean, do you think that's going to affect it all the way they perceive you? Do you think there might be some sort of mentality of like, he had his chance. We got to make it our chance. I mean, we've certainly have seen returning players play with new players in previous seasons. This is obviously a very unorthodox example, because again, to your point, maybe not even half a day is what you spent in the game. But do you expect any of that perception to come with these other players? I do. I do. And, and when it does the only thing that I can do is hit it head on. Like, no pun intended. Yeah, I was going to say, Bruce, uh, was... not again, please. <laughs> <Lawson>. <laughs> I like, I gotta, I have to, I have to not shy away from it. Yes. Yes. I went through everything that you just went through at Ponderosa. Yes. I went through everything through the first challenge. Yes. I, I made it here to the beach. So yes, but guess what? When we wake up tomorrow morning, this is brand new to all of us. So we can just run with it if we want, if you want to, if you want to think that I have an edge up on you, perfectly fine. Keep running with that. Let everybody know. Cause I'm going to play a game in regards to, I'm going to have some fun with you. We're going to have, we're all going to have a good time and I'm not going to shy away from what people's thoughts and or expectations are. But one thing I will say, if they come at me in with, with the 44 vibe of dad, cause I'm older. Oh no, that's not going to happen. That's oh, not gonna okay. Happen. I'm I'm coming at it like all right. Think about something. I want you I want you to think about like a Thanksgiving Day dinner, right? Please, yeah. And you hang out at the Thanksgiving Day dinner, and everybody's getting ready to eat, and then boom, boom, 
doorbell rings, door opens up. Hey, what's going on? Who just showed up? Your crazy drunk uncle. That's me. I'm <laughs> coming up to, I'm coming out to like crazy drunk uncle and I'm gonna have a damn good time. Don't call me dad. That's already been used. That's mm-hmm. old school stuff. I I'm just coming in and having a good time and want to have it's just there's no way to get around it. Wow. So I've heard people say I'm gonna play like a cop. This time I'm a criminal. Pretty sure they'll want to say last time I was the dad, this time I'm the drunk uncle on the Survivor season. Let's go. Well, <laughs> from that perspective, I mean, listen, this is uh, far from your first time in this preseason Ponderosa. I'm curious, though, from your own perspective, are there people just from first impressions that you're eyeballing of like, if I'm with this person on a tribe, I feel like I'll get along with them. I feel like that's someone I want to work with. Yes, yes. Um, I'm not discounting anyone because mm. things change. You know, you could have a tribe swap and if there's someone that's here and you have a preconceived notion and you're like, ugh, I don't want to deal with that person. They're annoying. They're loud. They're, you know, they, they snore, they eat weird. Like if, if you find a reason to not like someone, then you have to work with them. <laughs> Man, if you don't have the ability to make that change from I don't like working with you to working with you, I, that's going to be tough for anybody, especially if you're hungry, you're missing family, um, you have bumps and bruises or whatever have you, you're not going to want to make that change. That's why I'm looking at everybody like a potential person to work with. Um, mm-hmm. Are there people that are going to get themselves, which I think in my mind voted out quickly because of their, you know, over eagerness or, you know, you can kind of see the per- the people that are smiling too much or want to like kind of lean, lean in towards you and kind of make that eye contact. Okay, and- no, no, spill, spill the tea here. Give me, obviously you don't know names, but like, give me some descriptors. Is there like a particular person that fits this in your mind? <laughs> Man, listen, um, just between me, you and everybody listening. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> There, you know, there's one, one gentleman, really nice guy. He looks like a really nice guy. Um, you know, we'd, we'd hang out and have a beer at some point in time, but you got to take the cheese down, man. Like you got to, like, I can see that all this smiling, you don't recognize the time that I saw you when you were aggravated about something and you literally, your face changed. Like you would not believe. And I'm like, Oh, that's easy. Now I can look at this person and be like, yo, did you know that blah, blah, blah said X, Y, and Z? Go ahead, go blow your game up, bro. And he's going to go take off and do his thing. Like, Hey, it, it is hmm. like, I'm going to utilize what I'm, what I'm seeing here. Um, and then there's the, the meek, you know, people that look like they're meek and they're, you know, they're um, shy, and if you're just smart enough to just listen, and when they're having a conversation with with one of the handlers, oh, they're they're crazy. They're they're just nuts. They just want to talk, 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 talk. Like, oh man, this is gonna be. A good like, um, and my job is to listen. I'm just gonna listen. I'm gonna listen. I'm like, it, the beautiful thing about being in sales is that you listen. You have two ears, one mouth. Mm-hmm. Hey, two ears win. So you just listen. So I'll be listening to everything that's going on. But you know, I I'm willing to work with everybody. That's just, that's how yeah. I look at it. Let me present a scenario to you, uh, and you just missed out on this in your season, but let's say a boat comes to your camp in the pre-merge. Somebody says, pick one person to go on a journey. You know this. You have been part of a season that has had this. What is your strategy? Are you volunteering? Are you trying to like throw someone else under the bus? What are your thoughts behind this? I'm more than willing to go. I don't care. Like it's like this is this is something that I'm never gonna be able to do again. And I know that I said that before because I in my heart I knew I, I knew that I was never playing again. I thought I was done until I got the you know the information that I was coming back. If they come back and they say, Oh, we need someone to get on the boat right now, I'm just gonna go, I'll go. Mm. Why not? You yeah. want to live full experience. Oh, worrying about what people are saying back at camp. If you do your job correctly. This is probably six or seven, you know, maybe six days that go by before they come and get you, or even three days that go by before they come and get you. If you're not having the proper conversations, if you're not getting the proper buy-in from the people that are around you, then then be scared. Don't go. Oh, no, it's, it's a kiss of death. It was a kiss of death back in the old version of Survivor. The new version of Survivor, it's not. And then when you come back, why lie? Why lie? Mm-hmm. Listen, hey, I got X, Y, and Z. Hell yeah, you're gonna lie. I'm gonna tell them they're gonna gonna have an advantage. But I mean, this is what happened. Hey, we got all this, and I don't have a vote or whatever have you. I'm gonna, you know, you stretch the truth as much as possible. You know, you don't you don't break it. You stretch it, mm. and then you know you have nothing else to worry about. I don't. I would never say no to an adventure and going out, going for a walk up a hill, 
going, you know, walking across, you know, to a rocky area, like, you know, across the water. I don't care. I'm going to take care of whatever I possibly can and have as much fun as I can. Give me your biggest superpower and your biggest piece of kryptonite in your life and how that might play into your game. I'm going to go with the kryptonite first. Uh, the kryptonite is going to be the ability to not have food whenever I want it. Oh mm. my God. I tried at home. I tried for like, I think I lasted 6.25 hours. Um, <laughs> and my dog looked like a, 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 a five course meal. Um, <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Oh, Bruno is about to be, nom, 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 nom. Um, but no, so that would be my kryptonite. And, you know, my, my biggest superpower is just, just the, you'll see it. I'm going to have the ability to, to ask the proper questions just to get an answer. There's a mm. different, like you, you, Hey, uh, you know, Mike, what, 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 what time is it today? Tell me the time. Okay. What color is that? Tell me the color. Do you like that color? Yes or no? That's it. Those are mm. closed-end questions, man. I'm going to ask open-end questions. I'm going to ask the ones that are going to make you think a little bit. And then I'm not going to take your first answer. So I'm going to ask you an open-ended question. I'm going to ask you another open-ended question. And I'm going to get the truth of the third question that I ask you. So Interesting. Yeah, I mean, how tough is that to like walk that fine line of being able to ask those questions without feeling like you're Jeff Probst at Tribal Council, right? To not feel like, man, Bruce is really coming in like an interrogator. Do I really want to open up with this guy? Yeah, you have to be personable. You have to like, like people answer Jeff's questions because they love his face. Mm. And he smiles with big ass dimples on his face. Hey, so <laughs> what do you say that? What do you mean? Like, oh, what's the reaction that you're making right now? Like, because you're looking at Jeff like, oh, Jeff, what do you want to know? I'll tell you whatever you need to know. I'm not Jeff, not by any stretch of the imagination, but I do have the ability. And then I have the ability to sit there and say, okay, they're getting a little frazzled. So I'm just going to step back and you know, give them a little shoulder nudge and be like, bah, like make them laugh and then move on. Mm. Last thing I want to ask you, you said big fan. So again, I won't spoil this episode, but what is, in your opinion, your biggest survivor hot take? What's like the most controversial survivor opinion you have? <laughs> the younger generation will not get my humor. They Ooh. will not get it. It's, um, you know, and I, you know, I will make fun of myself like you would like easy. That's, that's not hard to do because I know who I am. Um, I will crack jokes. I'll have fun. But I have to also understand that the younger generation will not appreciate to the fullest extent my humor. Meaning that I'll say something and maybe the you know camera guy might chuckle because he's a little older. You know, the producer might chuckle a little older. And the youngins might be like, so I got to read the room, but I got to make sure that, and, and keep in mind that the younger generation might not know my humor. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much the dog eating joke will work. It worked with me. I'm not sure if the other, the younger generation might like that. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> way. Just like, I, I was kidding. It was a joke. Like, <laughs> Oh my God. Well, no matter what, like jokes or serious statements or open-ended questions, I'm so happy you got this chance, man. Like you are busting with energy right now. I could just feel it through the screen at this moment. And I know that like second chances are hard to come by in life, in Survivor. And I know you were going to put all the shape you're making that heart into everything that you give. And that makes me, that makes me so excited. I'm ready to see drunk uncle Bruce personally. <laughs> but I want to say something really quick. That wasn't, that wasn't a heart. That was oh. a square. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> Bruce, I've done a 180. Mea culpa. <laughs> I admit it. Okay. You've, you've showed me and I'm ready to see in season 45, me be proven wrong 26 days with a million dollar check at the end of it. That'll be a rectangle, not a square with your name on it. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> All Hello right. There. Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm doing good. This Rob has a podcast. This is Rob has a podcast slash parade. I'm Mike Bloom. I'm the catch all right now. Your one stop shop. Dude, Mike, man, I've listened to you so much, man, over the years. This is crazy that I'm talking to you. Well, nice to meet you, man. Give me, give me everything about you. Give me your name. Where are you from? What do you do? Give me the deets. Yeah, dude. So my name's Jake. I'm from Hanson, Massachusetts. I live in Boston with my grandmother in her house. I am a newly bad lawyer. And um, I teach theater to kids. I am a bartender. That's kind of the quick rundown. 
I recently my, lost 80 pounds. That's also something that has been kind of something I've been talking about. I mean, that was a quick rundown, but like a very comprehensive rundown. I got to stop in on a couple points about that. So congratulations, <laughs> obviously, on the, the recent accomplishment with, with passing the bar. So when it comes to like bartending, teaching, I'm assuming that was something that, that predates this new law career? Yeah, well, no. So I took time. So I did theater all throughout um, middle school, high school, undergrad. And then I stopped doing it uh, during law school because I need to focus on my studies. And then it was actually funny because I got a call from my old theater director and she's like, J she has her own dance studio. And she was like, Jake, do you want to, I'm trying to revive my theater program post COVID. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not in school anymore. Let me like direct a show with these kids. And like, I have a co-director who's a great friend of mine and uh, we're doing the Lion King right now. So I had to leave the kids. It was super sad leaving them, telling them, oh, I got to do something with work. And one of the preschoolers wrote me a letter and I was like, oh man, like, I'll be back to see the show though. I will get to see the show, but I'm, I'm, I'm missing a bulk of it. And I feel, I feel bad about it. So what brings you to the pride lands that is Fiji? Why are you here competing on Survivor? Dude, I'm competing on Survivor because I want to test myself, man. Like I've been watching this show since one world, one world I watched kind of sporadically. And then mm -hmm. by Philippines, I was like every episode. I remember watching the first episode of Survivor Philippines and I'm in my living room. Um, it's showing the Matt Singh beach. Everyone's in their underwear. Um, Denise pops on the screen. It says sex therapist on the Chiron. And my dad walks in. And he's like, Jake, what the hell are you watching? Oh, no. <laughs> I took off from there. <laughs> my goodness. So that being said, whether or not Denise may be included in here, uh, give me one Survivor winner and give me one Survivor non-winner that you identify with the most, strategically, personally, whatever. Oh, man. I've been saying two names for winners that I identify with. I've been saying Chris Doherty because I feel like, you know, I feel like I can bullshit like him. That's a throwback that, name. Yeah, that's I a really name like I haven't Vanuatu heard in a long time. Vanuatu. Hell yeah, Vanuatu stands rise up, man. I'm with you. <laughs> I, dude, I love it, man. Like, there's some, is it the tightest cast? No, but there's some great moments there. And you know what? Eliza, Amy, Twyla, Scout, Chris, Saj, like Rory, like this, I, I love Vanuatu. Um, so I feel I feel like something that's been lost in recent seasons. And I think Jeremy Collins is to blame for this. I love him. He's amazing. Jeremy, you know, he's repping, you know, Boston. So I'm big pro Jeremy. But everyone thinks they have to be super honest in Final Tribal. And I don't think that's true. I think you see that with Chris. I think you see that with Todd. Um, they bullshit. I mean, you have to be a good bullshitter because people have to believe you. But you don't have to be 100% honest in Final Tribal. And I think people have kind of gotten away from that in recent seasons. So when I get to Final Tribal, I'm hoping to bring that back and hopefully blow some smoke up some asses. Interesting. You got a, a similar non-winner bullshitter that you associate yourself with? <laughs> yeah. Um, probably. I like Dom Abate a lot. Mm. I like Dom a lot, man. Dom is like. Uh, he, he, he brings a lot to the tail. I mean, he's the person to get the closest to winning without actually winning. You know what I yeah, mean? True. Wendell, Wendell rightfully wins that season. Cause when, you know what, Wendell has one hell of a social game and I don't think, you know, that can be taken away from him whatsoever. But I, I like, I like Don, like he, he reminds me of a lot of people that I know. And like, I, I just, every time, like, I just think of like that scene where he's talking to Kellen and he has the coffee in his hand. He's like, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, all right. Yeah, no, we could do that. And then not doing it. Like, I forget what quote that was, but I love that moment. Do you have a favorite moment in the history of Survivor? Is it around Dom or Chris or any of these guys you just mentioned? <laughs> I'm going to give a basic one, but Tony, Tony holding the idol and Jeff, like, I don't think it happened today. Can you validate this for me? Can you validate this for me, Jeff? Like, I love that. Like, that's a great moment. Just like, look at back. I look at all of them. You know what I mean? Like, dude, that, I love the theater of it. People need to play into the theater of tribal council. And something Jeff told us the other day is that you need to take his questions and throw them back. And that really wasn't something I was thinking about before the game. But I think I'm really equipped to do that just based on my training as an attorney. Like, I may not have done a trial yet because I'm a new lawyer, but I have argued things in court and I do have the training to do a trial. And then I also have, like, my performance background. So I don't think there's a better combination of things that's going to be able to use travel and take Jeff's questions and 
turn them into advantage. Like I always got crap like doing theater and stuff because I was always last to remember my lines. But I feel like there are more guidelines than actually say these things. You know what I mean? But some people worked really well with it. Other people didn't. I had to learn my lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that being said, I was going to ask you, you know, if, if you have one life experience you feel has prepared you, is that from that like occupational stuff, the, the multifacetedness that you have with your theater and your, your lawyering, or is there like another life experience you had that you feel like is actually going to make you a good survivor player? I think, so it's kind of in tandem two things, right? So when I went to law school, like I tell everyone law school is kind of like boot camp like mentally, like it's supposed to break you down and then build you back up to think in a more efficient, uh, more logical manner. And then during the time in law school is when I went, when um, I finally like stopped binge eating and I adopted a healthier lifestyle. And um, so kind of like the more healthier I made my lifestyle, the better I did in school and mm. the better I did in school, the more motivated I was to, you know, deal with my eating problems and like, work on myself um so like when I was studying for the bar all I did was study and work out and it was just able to get me in the right mindset and I think like that hard work and determination that like I entirely like like reorganized myself over the course of two years two to three years and like I, I ran my first spot and race this last year and that was like wow. a super emotional experience because like I like at 15, I would have never imagined that I would do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just that that was a that was a big moment for me. And so I feel like I know how to work hard. During law school, I worked two jobs. Like I'm not a person who was taking the weekends to ride yachts, you know, because my daddy's not a lawyer. You know what I mean, man? I didn't have the money to do that. How do you think people are gonna perceive you in this game? You have so much of a diverse background to you. How much of that do you think people are going to pick out when they're making assessments of you? So I think people are, the first thing people are going to realize that I'm loud. I think the thing is, is that like, people say it like, Jake, like you come across, like you used to be a football player. I'm like, no, nah, dude, like I can, I can name more Broadway actors than MLB players or something. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like I really can. And like, I think as soon as people get to talk to me, they're going to realize that I'm not like, dude, I like drinks with fruit in them. That's just like my thing. Like I, I'm not a big beer guy. I'm not a big car guy. You know, I hate driving. It freaks me out. I do drive reluctantly, but I, I think people are going to see that they, they might have this idea. Oh, he's a big Boston bro. He's probably going out drinking with his buddies on the weekend or whatever. And like, I'll do that from time to time. But like, I'm not like, I, I work with kids. I work in juvenile court. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm not a big bruiser. I mean, like root, you know what I mean? Yeah. What are you seeking out in others, especially when it comes to Alliance mates? What characteristics are you looking for? So I'm looking for people who can't lie. Like, I think one of the things that is going to benefit me in this game is that one of the things that I read a long time ago, and it pisses my parents off, but the more people, and this, I don't know if I get in trouble for this, but the more people cuss, the more people believe they're being honest. Like that's an yeah. actual psychological fact. So I might drop a few more four letter words than everyone else. And people will You're think- You're going to cost the show it. so much money and stand your I'm going to try to avoid it. <laughs> I'm going to try to avoid it where I can, but it's a, but like that works psychologically. Like- I don't think I come across as like a typical lawyer. So the more I can be like just me and like present myself to these other people, that's going to do better. But what am I looking Sorry. What am I looking for in other people? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm looking for honesty. Like if I, if I sniff out that you're being dishonest with me, I'm going to have to get rid of you. Like, that's what's up. I mean, every, every, like I'm going to go out there. I'm going to lie. I'm an ADA. I'm going to tell them I'm a public defender. But I feel like that job's close enough to what I do where I can be like, I'll still be a public defender in the juvenile court, but I'll just flip sides. Mm. So when it comes to people right now that you're looking at, is there anyone that you're like making judgments at right now in preseason of like, either this is someone that I'm eyeballing that I might want to work with or like big red flag, stay away from that person at all costs. Yeah. So, I mean, the big thing I'm sure everyone talking, everyone's talking about is Bruce, right? So. Bruce is here. 
if you didn't, I, if you didn't see him already, you shouldn't be here. Like you should have watched 44. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's someone I'm open to working with. Cause he's like in my area. I mean, there's a lot we know about him, but there's a lot we don't know. Cause he only played for 12 hours, but people that I'm looking at, there's a girl here who seems like she has a little wilderness training experience. She has a bunch of tattoos. She's a taller girl. She has curly hair. Um, she's got like a Fox tattoo on her leg. Um, she seems like the kind of person who is going to try to get a lot of guys out. Um, she hasn't been like, like other people you make eyes at, you know what I mean? And like, nod, good morning. You know what I mean? But you can't talk to them, but she hasn't been given too many, um, smiles and stuff. Like I've been smiling at everyone. <laughs> like, I don't know if I'm supposed to do that or not, but like, I, I haven't been getting great vibes from her. Um, there's a couple people I've been getting good vibes from though. There's a kid with the Afro with an Afro who's walking around. He looks like a great time, man. Like he's just been smiling at everyone. He's smiling at me and I see him smiling at other people. So like, I don't know if I trust him, but I'm like, I still kind of want to hang out with them. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I got to watch out for that. Cause before I came out here, my girlfriend's like, Jake, you can't just trust everybody out here. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Well, let me finish by giving you someone you can trust. If you could pick a celebrity or a fictional character to come out as your loved one for a visit on Survivor, who are you picking and why? Uh, if people aren't saying a past player, like I need a past player out here to take notes from, you know what I mean? Like, that's what I want, you know? But you have a past player in your court? Give me Tony. Give me Tony to give me some advice. You know what I mean? Like, I I'm using that to an advantage. If I could pick anyone real or fake, give me Tony. Give me some advice and maybe give me a couple laughs too, you know? Oh, absolutely. I think the energy you have, especially when you did that Tony impression, I think the two of you were just bouncing off each other might be like a particle uh, collision, you know? We might dude, be that'd be beautiful, man. Absolutely. Well, dude, I wish you nothing but the best in everything. Best of luck, you know, as, as you're going through here, trying to eyeball people, trying to smile, but not smile too much. Break a leg, I should say. And, Thanks, uh, man. Looking forward to hopefully seeing you for your 11 o'clock number at Final Tribal Council. Dude, thanks, Mike. This is so awesome to meet this you, This is man. awesome, man. It's so great to meet you. All the best. Thanks so much again, dude. Hello. Hello there. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing well. Let me introduce myself. I'm Mike Bloom. Uh, I'm with Parade Magazine as well as Rob has a podcast. And who might I be speaking Hi. with today? My name is Katura. Hello, Katura. So nice to meet you. Uh, give me, Give me the bio line. Where are you from? What do you do? Oh my God, this is so crazy. I honestly have, they didn't even tell us we were doing this interview. So I'm just actually kind of shocked. Welcome. <laughs> like, this is Survivor. Like, everything takes you by surprise. <laughs> I know. And then she was like, it's Rob has a podcast. And I was like, wow, Rob has a podcast? Is this official? <laughs> I'm just so excited. Like I thought I was just a crazy person watching it. I didn't know you guys were so in the game. This is cool. Uh, okay. Sorry. You asked me, what would you want to, well, where, where are you from and what do you do? I am from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm a civil rights lawyer and I've been living in Brooklyn for almost six years now. Oh, wow. So how long have you been involved? Cause I would imagine, you know, obviously the law came first, but specifically with the civil rights side of things. I've been involved in the civil rights side of the law since before I was a lawyer. So I've oh, been wow. an attorney for about eight years now. Actually, next month will make eight years. Um, and civil rights work has always been my passion and my focus. You know, you start off a little bit and you can't always jump right into it because, you know, you got to get the bills paid and work at the big law firms. <laughs> <laughs> so I did my dues with that. But yeah, now I'm, you know, proud to be like working at one of the top civil rights law firms in the country. Yeah. And that is, you know, obviously incredible work now more than ever, especially. Where did that come from? Is there just like a, a general sense of like generosity and justice that you've always had that allowed you to want to pursue this line of work? Oh, I love that. Just a general sense of generosity and justice. I wish I could say that was my story. Um, unfortunately, no, it, it's really just, you know, being a black person in, in America, like, mm -hmm. you, you know, if you if you're a blind person, you can see just how deeply normalized racial injustice is. And I just remember being a child and looking around and just noticing like, 
there are certain communities that, you know, don't have access to basics like healthcare and clean water and food and schools. Um, and, and realizing most of the time that was impacting my community and just deciding to do something about it. That's amazing. So then that being said, with what you're able to do for your community, cut to survivor, an inherently <laughs> like cutthroat game. Nice. What made you decide to <laughs> make that jump to the point where you're talking with me today? Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of crazy. Everybody's asking that. They're like, well, yeah, how did you get here? You know, like you're so dedicated to the movement. And I'm like, I am. And it's true. My work is my everything. But you know, civil rights lawyers are still people, right? Like I'm still Absolutely. a full fundamental multidimensional person. You still got and student debt. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, first of all, this uh, 500,000, because they keep calling it a million, this 500,000 post taxes <laughs> will not be going to student loans for sure. Um, but no, I just, you know, I... I work hard, you know, and my work is emotionally draining. It's really emotionally taxing. Um, I spend a lot of my time like in front of a laptop with emails and, you know, doing work and rigorous deadlines. And I just wanted to remember that like, I'm actually a adventurous, crazy, exciting person. Like I am such a lawyer, but not only a lawyer, you know, like I'm ready to, you know, be scared shitless jumping in the ocean while Jeff is screaming at me, you know? I can do that and like defend my people too. <laughs> Absolutely, totally. It's so that's be being... a way to do both. So what's your history with the show? How long have you been watching people scared shitless jumping in the ocean while Jeff probes yells at them? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I feel almost embarrassed to say it at this point because I know everybody is pretty much diehard super fans from like day one, you know, since they were kids. I actually haven't been watching Survivor since I was a kid. Um, I kind of rediscovered it, I would say in 2020. The world was crazy. Um, mm -hmm. My job specifically deals with police violence on Black people. So George Floyd had just been murdered. Um, I was dealing with that working directly. COVID was hitting. It was like, you know, really just terrible. Everything was just going to shit. And I was just like, I need an escape. And I just saw like an episode or season of Survivor on Netflix. And then I started watching it and I was like, I remember this. You know how you like remember like having seen it like years ago, but not like really watched it. And I started watching it with my like adult eyes. And I was like, I fucking love this show. Like, Oh my God. And I binged watch, I'm telling you, 2020 and 2021, my Paramount Plus membership <laughs> was off the chain. <laughs> I got <sighs> full use of that $13.99. Like <laughs> I was constantly watching Survivor. Um, and then like last year, was it the was oh yeah, it was last year. I had Survivor on in the background as I usually do. It was literally just like my comfort show. And uh I don't know. I would just have having a really rough day and I was tired and I was looking at people do stuff. And I was like, why are you just watching this? Why mm. haven't you applied? What are you doing? Like, what's the reason not to? And I kid you not, I just like told myself, okay, I'm going out to dinner this night. So I'll like look halfway decent. <laughs> so since I'm going to like put on some makeup and look decent, go ahead and make my casting, you know, application video, whatever it is. And don't think anything of it, record it, send in the first draft. I did exactly that. And they called me two days later. Wow. So that being said, as someone who, you know, blitz through a lot of Survivor, give me one Survivor winner and give me one Survivor non-winner that you identify with the most. Could be personal, could be strategic, how you want to play the game. One winner, one non-winner. I actually have one name for both of those. Okay, amazing. <laughs> Oddly enough. Uh, you know, the first person that always comes to mind is Natalie. Um, and I'm talking about uh, Natalie, who has the twin sister, not Natalie, who went with Russell. Yes, Natalie Anderson. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I don't know her last name, but just I, I mean, she's a winner, right? And then at Winner's Award, she didn't win. So yeah. she's also kind of a non winner there. So I feel like she hits both of them. But I just love her badass spirit. Like, I just saw something in her that said, you know, I remember when there was that crazy, ridiculously extreme 
tasks that they had to do for like one token and everybody was like dying and she just kept going kept going kept going and then at the end when she finished she just kind of released all of this emotion and just like cried her heart out and I, I really identify with that moment because that's kind of how my life has been it's like you got to go you got to get it done you really don't have time to stop and be worried about anything just get it done and then you know you can cry about it later and so that's kind of what I feel like I'm bringing into Survivor like I'm going to figure it out and then you know when you go to the confessional <laughs> then that'll be your time to like cry and like get all the you know oh my god today was crazy out <laughs> yeah what's one life experience you feel has prepared you most for the game one particular experience that's prepared me for the game hmm, um I don't really have one thing specifically but I mean honestly like I walk through the world every day as a black queer woman like all three of those identities put me at risk of danger at all times like I'm always alert I'm always in survival mode I'm always watching is this going to be the group that doesn't like me is this going to be the people that feels bothered by me you know in some ways I'm socially at the bottom you know in many different ways and a lot of times I don't have advantages and I just kind of have to like figure it out you know um I was <laughs> just telling the producers we were laughing and I was like you know whatever happens whatever crazy twist they throw at us I feel confident that I can figure it out because I figured out everything else. You know, I, I didn't know anybody who went to college before I went to college. I didn't know anybody who went to law school before I huh. went to law school. Like, all of those things in my life have just been brand new. And I just jumped in and prayed for the best. And I'm hoping it works here too. <laughs> well, yeah, to that point about, you know, identity and the way people see you, how do you think you're going to be perceived in this game? How do you hope you'll be perceived in this game? Ooh, I'm nervous. I don't know. I really don't know. I was watching like how all the people on Twitter were responding to this, you know, season 43 cast and 44 cast and just kind of seeing how like what people respond in general. And I was trying to think like, okay, well, what would they might say about me? Honestly, I have no idea. I, I think I'm just, I'm very unique. I don't think that I can like fit into a particular box. Um, I think people might be rooting for me on one hand because I'm like perpetually an underdog. On another hand, people might be annoyed by me because sometimes I'm cranky. Sometimes I'm, you know, a little spoiled. I'm a little bit clumsy. I trip a lot. <laughs> I'm praying that I do not trip or fall like, you know, at a critical time or near a machete, you know, so those are the things I'm like going into the game being like, just avoid the machetes, avoid, you know, like, I just, I honestly don't know. Like it, it could be, it could be overwhelmingly positive. It could be overwhelmingly negative, but I've already told myself it doesn't even matter. Like this is a journey for me. Um, I don't often get to do things for me. Most of what I do is for and in service of others or thinking about others. So, um, you know, this is, this is to set my soul on fire. So it'll be good either way. Are you looking at you know, other people when it comes to making alliances and seeing certain things that you want, what do you seek out in like a ride or die or a number one? What I seek out in an alliance member is unrelenting, illogical loyalty. Like <laughs> I want, I want them to be so connected to me that they're like, I don't even, I don't even care if I don't win. I want you to know so-and-so is trying to blindside you. And I'd be like, thank you. This is exactly what we wanted. <laughs> I want that like Laurel to Wendell loyalty. Mm. Like, you know, I think um, Dominic said like, as soon as there was a tie, and he knew that Laurel had to cast a tiger. He was like, I knew I lost then. And I was like, that's, what, I want an alliance partner so close to me like that, that it, it's just not a shadow of a doubt that they're going to just ride for me. Um, now, I know this is Survivor and I know that that's unlikely, but I'm hoping <laughs> that that's like the best case scenario. But I also know that people will be in alliance with you um, as long as it's beneficial to them. So I'm really hoping just for people who are like reasonable, and logical and we can say like sure at some point it may not be logical for us to be alliance members and we can try to cut each other's throat then but let's at least get the next three votes together you know of the people that you are with right now are there any specific yeah. individuals where you're like 
I see you. I want to work with you. Are there specific individuals you're looking at and saying like red flag, make sure to get rid of you as soon as possible? Yeah, that's so crazy. Uh, well, there's definitely two people who I was like, I definitely want to be in alliance with them. Um, and they're like softer, quieter, sweeter people because I think they might be good for my secret alliance. Like I, I want to have a public one and I want to have a secret one. Um, and I think having like someone that people just deem like soft spoken and kind of can easily look over and not think too much of would be great. I'm thinking like an Erica and Heather duo energy. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I can't honestly, there's there's two people who I was like, I definitely can feel like negative energy from them, not loving them. And then literally today, like we all like took a boat together and like I saw a different side of them and I was like, okay well maybe they'll be not you know like so I don't know like I feel like it can change like I'm just keeping it open so I'm going to give you a scenario let's say you're at your tribe camp hanging out at the beach a boat okay. pulls up some guy gets out and you have to pick one person to go on a journey now you know I the, personally have to pick them or the tribe has to. the tribe gets to so like are you stepping up in the moment are you trying to like get someone else to go in your place because you know these things could be both good and bad now, you know, I am damn well not getting on that boat. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, I will fake an injury to not get on that boat. The only way that I'm willing to get on the boat is if it's, you know, deep enough, I would say, into the game where I feel quote unquote comfortable because you can never be fully comfortable, but comfortable enough to where I know I could go come back and lie and either people will believe it or it wouldn't be the end of the world. Like I have a strong enough alliance and I could tell people what I got and they'd be fine with it. So how does that translate to advantages for you? Like, are you going to be hungry to look for everything as long as you don't have to get on a boat or are you staying away from it as much as you are or the journeys? Oh, no, no. I, I, I know I'm going to need advantages. I already know, like, you know, my goal is to play the kind of low key character and, you know, be a little bit in the background, but realistically, I don't think my personality allows that. So I know at some point I'm going to be a target. Like I know that. Um, and uh, yeah, so the only reason I'm saying not getting on the boat, is just in those beginning days, like I'm not going to mm -hmm. be the first person on the boat because then you have not you've not made a really deep connection on anybody you know what I mean it's easy for someone to say he probably got something and then everybody's looking for an easy comfortable vote off right I'm not trying to do that I already know who's the only person in survivor history who's got voted off first twice a black woman lawyer yeah, I'm not mm. trying to repeat anything like that. So I am being super cautious those first couple of votes. After that, I'm absolutely looking for advantages, absolutely looking for idols. Um, if it requires me sneaking away, doing whatever, that I will be doing it. Absolutely. <laughs> Last question. If you could pick a celebrity or a fictional character to bring out as a loved one, okay. who are you picking and why? To bring out as a loved one? Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh. Do I even care about any celebrity or fictional character enough to I mean, like, you know, the loved one is supposed to be like, I'm at my lowest moment and I'm filthy. These people are trying to get me. I, I need love and support. I don't know if I would want it from a random celebrity who doesn't know me. You know what I mean? I think I'd much rather have it from a family member. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't think of anybody. All right. You may be like the first person I've ever asked this to who said, uh, I'm good. Send him back. I'm fine without him. Well, I think, I think I'd rather be like, can you send my family? <laughs> like <laughs> send people who know me, who can like give me encouragement. Like, no, they're where they're going to say, you can do it. You're strong, but they don't really know if I can do it or if I'm strong. They're just saying that, you know, I need somebody who's like, I know you, Katura. Don't fuck up this or sorry. I didn't mean to curse. Okay. Um, do that. Do that. You know what I mean? Like I need people who are like, can be honest with me and tell me about myself. <laughs> well, we are so happy that we got to know you over the course of this interview. Uh, you're just such a delight. And I, I'm so excited to see the perspective that you bring, I think is, is so great. 
and to bring that hopefully into the game and translate into you know a million dollar check or five hundred thousand dollars at the end of the day yes. it's gonna yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be <laughs> awesome so i'm really excited to see your journey just watch out for the machetes Oh, absolutely. It is my number one rule. Do not get medically evacuated. That is the number one rule. I'm like, it doesn't matter how good your strategy is. If you fuck up around that machete and you're out, like, and everything goes shit. So yes, thank you so much, Mike. It was good talking to you too. Who am I talking with today? Oh yeah, my name is Kelly. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. So give me the, uh, give me the elevator pitch on Kelly. Where are you from and what do you do? Sure. So my name is Kelly Nalbandian. I'm 29 years old. Uh, I'm a critical care nurse in New York City. And then I also attend Yale part-time, getting my master's to become a nurse practitioner. Wow. So how long have you been in the medical profession? I mean, I would imagine long enough to be on the front lines of, you know, some very wild stuff from the past few years. Yeah. So I actually uh, became an EMT when I was 18 years old. And then uh, since then, I just I was kind of exploring figuring out if I wanted to go to medical school or, or what and then I you know watched the nurses that I would come across in the emergency room and like you know they were just the badasses running the show and so um I went to nursing school and so it's been a long time but yeah about um about a year into my nursing career uh the pandemic hit um and I was in New York City so obviously it was Oh, it was definitely the most challenging and difficult thing I've ever had to do in my life. And, uh, you know, but kind of funnily, like that is the time when I discovered Survivor. And one of my friends, who's also a nurse, we were, you know, hanging out. No one wants to come within 10 feet of us because we're like infectious vectors, unfortunately. And, you know, what are we going to do? And like, we, we all needed, you know, a distraction during that time. And so it started off as that, you know, she put on heroes, villains. And so obviously... I was screwed. I was going to be obsessed. <laughs> yeah. So that being said, when it came to like the difference between being a fan and a player, I mean, what led you from being the badass of that show to hopefully being a badass on a very different type of show? What made you feel like you wanted to come out and play this thing? You know, I just as I, I watched like all, almost all of the seasons in like a span of two years. So as I was like kind of going through them, I just, it just started as this like little thought in my head that probably started with the Black Widow Brigade. I watched that and I was like, oh my God, this looks like so much fun. Like, I really want to do this. And I'm super competitive. I don't really get a chance to be competitive as a nurse. You know, I grew mm. up playing sports and, you know, my whole family's like super competitive with like board games, like video games, anything, you name it, we're competitive. So I was super drawn to this because I just, I think that that aspect of it is so fun. Like the competition and the adventure, but you know, my job is really real. Like it, it is people at their core. It's, it's a really vulnerable, whether COVID or not, like, you know, even in critical care right now, like a huge part of my job is connecting with people in like a hyper vulnerable space. And so I think when I watch Survivor, I can, the story, like people's stories and like how they relate to each other and that whole kind of social experiment of everything also really appeals to me. So it's, it's, it kind of feels right for me where it's like, I feel like I'm kind of like tough, but also vulnerable. And so is Survivor. So from all the seasons you blitzed through with Survivor the past couple of years, give me one Survivor winner and one non-winner who you identify with the most, personally, strategically, whatever. Okay. Um, you know, there's been a lot of really great Kellys who have played this game, but I think the one that I relate to the most is Kelly Wentworth. Um, you know, I think that scrappy tenacious vibe is is something that we we both share <laughs> um and you know I'm, I'm a huge fan of hers that like Wentworth does not count like here's the hoping I get something like that um and then winner um I think I have to go with Parvati here I know she's mm. quite different from Wentworth but you know I think Parv like really like represents the ability to you know be a woman and play aggressively and ruthlessly but also be charming and be like kind of soft and be that person that people feel drawn towards and that's something that I think I'm good at in you know my real life that I think people you know are drawn to me and are friends with me not because I'm like the most charismatic or whatever but like I make them feel seen and heard and I'm really authentic and it promoting shared vulnerability and I think you know Parv is really good at that and in this game you can shift that into 
persuasion and manipulation. And she used sort of the guise of like flirting. You know, uh, I'm a lesbian, so I will not be flirting with any men. Cannot stomach that. But we can do some we can do some friendship flirting. I'm also engaged. So <laughs> there we go. I was gonna say, like, don't put friendship yourself in the flirting. doghouse. I know that of course there was the Natalie of the Black Widow Brigade, but let's not put ourselves in that territory either. <laughs> No, no, I'm not putting myself in the doghouse. First of all, she said I can do whatever I need to do to win. But um, no, I mean, friendship flirting. And that's the same thing. It's really just making people feel like, like listened to and mirroring back who they are. Like everyone wants to see themselves in somebody else. And especially in this environment where it's it's super stressful and really chaotic and something that I think I'm used to for my job. What's been your level of preparation, speaking towards just how intense your job is? Once you found out you were coming out here, how much have you been putting in in all the months leading up to it, considering, as you talked to me before, just like the immense amount of workload you have at this moment? I know. So it is really hard. Like I would come home from a 12 hour shift and be like, oh my God, I have to work out. And I'm on my feet literally all day. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty strong guy, but working out, but <laughs> you know, I, do have to like lug people who can't move in bed around like me and my other, you know, 120 pound friend who's also a nurse are like dragging people out of the bed. Um, it's, but it's really, it's really hard to fit it in for me because I have you know, school and work. Um, but I've, I actually applied originally um, in January of 2022. So it was sort of in the 43, 44 cycle. And I just was a little too late to <laughs> what I was told, you know, I was kind of a noob. So I had to learn the ropes. And, you know, they reassured me that they would bring, you know, call me back and, and give me, give me a shot for, for this round. So here I am. So I've been thinking about this for quite a long time as something that is a distinct possibility for me. Um, so it's, there hasn't been a day since I first got that call that I haven't thought about Survivor. And I go home to Connecticut to go to Yale and, and stay with my parents. Uh, so I, in the backyard making fire there, it's kind of hard to make fire in a New York city apartment. So <laughs> that was my like fire making station. And, you know, I've been, you know, doing a bunch of stuff. Really, something I really liked to enjoy doing was reading a, a lot of books. So I read like mm. The 48 Laws of Power, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, I read a lot of Ryan Holiday's books, which are based on stoicism, like The Obstacle is the Way and things like that um, to sort of help me kind of philosophically prepare for Survivor. And I think, mm. you know, I got to shift my gear a little bit. Uh, I'm excited to be devious and ruthless and things like that, but I don't do that as a nurse. So I think especially the 48 laws of power gets you, gets you into that kind of like Machiavellian zone. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you made that preparation because yeah, I would imagine to your point, you have this competitive streak and like, you're excited to let that show. I feel like there is a difference between that, which might um, more so apply to the challenges and like, Hey, I got to know this person and now I'm going to end their life in the game. So I think it's interesting that like, yeah. you're already trying to prepare I'm, I'm ready mindset. for it though. I'm excited. Interesting. Yeah. So like, mm -hmm. I don't know, yeah. how, how, how duplicitous do you plan on being over the course of this? <laughs> I think you don't need to be, I don't want to be duplicitous for no reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think there needs to be a reason to lie. There's no reason to juggle like 60 lies if it's not going to get you anywhere. Um, so I'm not like looking to come out here and like be lying right off the bat, but I'm, you know, absolutely willing to do whatever I have to do to get myself to the end. And I, I do want to believe that, you know, women in this new era can win and play a little bit more aggressively. You know, I think it, it can be hard and like women, we feel like we need to like shrink ourselves or play under the radar or whatever. And, you know, I don't really want to do that. So that being said, how do you think people are going to perceive you in the game? Um, you know, I'm really hoping that, and I, I think this is true, you know, nurses are voted the most trustworthy profession in the US like every year. And I think when you think of nurses, people think of like the school nurse who like gives them ginger ale and sends them home with their mommy, you know, <laughs> and, like that could not be farther from the job that I do and that I've always mm. done like yard and critical care. So, you know, if people want to think that like that's to their peril and I think people underestimate nurses and I definitely want to come out here and, and represent well, because being a nurse isn't just about like being nice and empathetic and stuff like that. That's a huge part of the job that I love. And that's what drew me to nursing was it's people focused, but you know, where I work and where I've worked, it's, it's requires a lot of intelligence and I know I'm smart. I don't think everyone will necessarily get that right away. And, and it's also like a physically demanding job. So it's one thing to be kind of book smart or, or know a lot of things, but can you actually function in high stress is yeah. is what makes it unique so I'm, I'm hoping people are just sort of I think nursing is kind of a disarming profession 
And so I'm hoping that will help me kind of let everyone feel like I'm like comforting them. And if they, you know, if they have a boo-boo, I can make it better. Well, yeah, it might be valuable. I mean, you've just been seeing what's been happening on 44, right? Where people are getting injured all I know. over the place. I'm, be like, I'm like, Bruce, I'm off duty. Okay. So we're not having any injuries this year. <laughs> I hope, I genuinely hope no one gets injured. I, I need a break from nursing. And, yeah. Uh, you know, they have a great medical team. Yeah, I'm on vacation <laughs> right now. It's my 26 day break. Please don't make me do this. Well, I mean, <laughs> how much are you going to try to play up that generosity though? Cause I know certainly like perception can always be a double-edged sword where, you know, Oh, you are this very nurturing person. And then how dare you stab me in the back? I'm not going to give you a million dollars. That's true. I mean, I think that's an, an important part of, you know, once you get to the end of the game or as you're going towards it is reading is the jury or certain people on the jury going to vote emotionally or are they going to vote strategically? And and that might impact how you play the game because you do need to play the game at the end towards the jury. So, but I, I think, you know, we're, I think we really should be in a generation of survivor players that are rewarding gameplay. And, you know, personally, if I'm going to go out, I'd rather go out with a friggin' bang then you know have it just be walking out so if someone if I blindside somebody hopefully hopefully they sort of you know are on the same page there but I I think that it's it's something that I can navigate because I know how to kind of talk my way out of things that I think Mm. in final tribal I can do a little mix of you know flattery and apology but still have it be sincere i mean that's a hard line to walk but i'm gonna try (laughs) when it comes to seeking out other people you kind of mentioned it previously in your answers but are there certain characteristics you're looking for ideally in like a number one or ride or die um you know i I don't want to go out with like like a huge set plan because i mean the people who are out there i have no idea who they're going to be um so i think a lot of it is really for back of, lack of a better word, like vibes, like, am I understanding them? Like, are we on the same frequency? Like, I definitely want to play with people who I have mutual respect for. And I think this, we're kind of an interesting part of the new era where you have all these people who've won, who aren't really traditional threats. So coming into this season, like what even is a threat? I don't know. And so like using, using that to sort of build bridges, you know, I'm not afraid to work with people who are like physically strong or, or seen as, you know, intimidating. I think that could be a beneficial for me sort of as a shield, but hopefully in a more of a partnership type way, but you know, there's not really any, I'm not excluding anyone. I really want my game to be about having options. So that being said, when it comes to first impressions, I mean, describe, you know, to me, is there someone out there right now amongst all these people you're walking around with at Ponderosa? Is there someone in particular that you're like looking at saying, yeah, this could be someone I could go with. Is there someone you're looking at and saying like big red flag, do not want to work with them? <laughs> um, you know, for me, when at Ponderosa, no one's talking. So it's really like, I definitely feel more inclined to go with people who do make eye contact, you know, will smile and things like that. And some people are a little bit more stone faced and stoic and are kind of like heads down following the rules. And uh, that sort of sets a little bit of alarm bells off for me because I definitely want to, in in my allies or anyone in the game, like I want to keep people around that I understand and that, you know, I can connect with them and they will be vulnerable with me so that I can Mm -hmm. understand who they are and think about how they might play the game, think about how they might vote in the end. So, you know, I, I'm not ruling anybody out, but there's definitely a couple of people that I think, you know, it could be fun. We'll see. Yeah. I'd like to, I would like to play with women. I'm not going to lie. We're, we'll see. I'm not, you know, in any, I'm not in any camp, you know, I think I can easily bro out with some dudes if I need to. Um, but <laughs> I, I think, you know, it, it's hard coming off season 44, especially like the, you need to sort of look out for each other a little bit. So I'm going to put a scenario in front of you. Let's say you're it's in the pre-merge, you're hanging out with your tribe, a boat comes and says, okay, tribe, you got to pick one person to go on a journey. Now, you know, uh-huh. these things could be both good and bad. Are you sticking to your competitive side and volunteering for it? Are you trying to put someone else in there instead? What's your strategy for handling that type of thing? I think my my strategy for handling that is like, I want to see if anyone, anyone volunteers and shoots their hands up because to me, that's a red flag. And I think that's an easy target to paint on somebody. If they want to be like, I want to go to the advantage island, me, like whether they lose their vote or they don't, like then that puts a target um, on their back for me. So I'm, I mean, obviously I want to, of course I want to find idols and advantages and things like that. You know, that's so much fun, but the early game, it's, it's really, it's very perilous. You know, losing your vote can impact you and your allies. Interestingly, I think a lot of people who lose their vote 
actually their ally goes home, which is really concerning. So that might be a factor in who I'd want to send to the island, whether it's me or, you know, hopefully not somebody I'm working with. Last question I want to ask, I'll throw another scenario at you. If you could bring one celebrity or a fictional character out for a loved one's visit, who would it be and why? Hmm. Um, okay, well, I just, this is kind of funny. I just watched the Hunger Games before I came here, which I kind of feel like this is the closest thing we have to like real Hunger Games. It better not be. Um, but like maybe Katniss, like what, she is such a queen. Like, I mean, give me a bow and arrow. I, I don't think I know how to do archery, but maybe she could teach me if that comes up in a challenge. Uh, you know, I think she's just like a super inspirational, powerful figure, so. Yeah. How, All right. how, how are you doing? I'm Mike uh, from Parade from RHAP. Very nice to meet you. Give me uh, give me the bio line. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Yeah, I'm Kendra. I live in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and I'm a bartender server. Interesting. Is this something that you've done for a while now? Or because I know that I believe in something you wrote that I, I got in a word of that you left college right before it ended to go build Earth ships in the middle of the desert, and I am just astounded by that sentence and what it might mean. That was like the beginning to my crazy Kendra shenanigans, let's just say. Um, yeah, so I learned of what Earth ships were because I was in environmental studies in college. But basically, they're self-sustained houses made out of recycled materials. So you dig into the ground a little bit, and then you get car tires essentially places will actually pay you to take the car tires from like old tire warehouses whatever and then you spend all day pounding uh these tires you have a dirt bitch the dirt bitch gives you the dirt to pound the tires in and you create these kind of like tire bricks you build up a wall cement in the holes and that's the basic foundation of an earthship they collect rainwater. There's three cycles that the water goes through. Then it goes into a, um, like, oh, I forget what the word's called, but basically it goes outside. And usually that's where you can grow like flowers, whatever. And then inside, so there's solar, um, pa passive solar for the house. So it's always built at a self-facing angle. And there's Earth ships in the middle of Taos, New Mexico that grow bananas year round. Interesting. Like there's banana trees in the house. Yeah. So you have this symbiotic relationship with the house. It's like when I shower, the shower water goes to the toilet and then the toilet water, you know what I mean? And then, or shower, that water goes to the plants. Then that, the plant water goes to the toilet and the toilet goes outside, you know? So it's just like this really amazing, and they're all off grid, solar ran. Um, they're just amazing houses, and more people should know about them. The best part is that you have to drink to build your house. So, you know, we'd get a 30 pack, crush a couple cans. One of my friends, he has a whole bottle of Bombay Sapphire um, bottles. It's super pretty in his bathroom. And you use cement and you create bottle can walls. Wow. So tell me and about it's really cool. Yeah. So tell me about how you've gone from constructing earth ships in the desert to possibly constructing shelters on the beach. What brings you to Survivor? Oh my gosh. You know, what brings me to Survivor is that same kind of gut feeling, excited feeling that I tend to follow in my life if you're not picking that up already. Mm. Uh so same thing that happened with Chaos and Mexico. I was like, this is something I have to do. Everyone thought I was crazy. They're like, Kendra, what do you mean? You're going to go build what? What are these? Da, da, da. And it's just some, it's just like a feeling that I get about these like adventures that I go on. It's just like, this is what I have to do and nothing's going to stop me. Same way with Survivor. I put on an episode I hadn't watched in a while. I put on an episode last summer to watch before I went to bed. No, I didn't go to bed. I stayed up for like eight hours completing the entire season. It was like seven o'clock in the morning. The damn birds are chirping and I'm laying there. Am I allowed to swear? Please. Oh, I'm laying there. This is verbatim what I say. I could win this fucking game. And then I, that was it. Everyone's like, Kendra. I'm like bartending. They're like, Kendra, what are you up to? I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be a survivor. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna be a survivor. I hadn't even applied yet, but like, I knew that I was going to be on this fucking show. And then I submitted my audition tape 
fast forward June, July, September. Oh no, June, July, August, September. Fast forward four months. I'm walking across fucking Spain and doing the Camino de Santiago by myself. And I like finally find Wi-Fi. I check in and I have an email from fucking Survivor. And then I'm like, I'm in. Like I already wow. knew it. Like I already knew it when I had applied, but like then, so I'm walking across country, this country that I've never been in before, taking Survivor interviews. <laughs> at these hostels that I'm staying at with all these strangers there's one day where they're like oh we need like a like a cover picture for you like a it has to be vertical it has to be like you know they needed a picture of me so I had, and I was there alone so I had to ask these strangers I was like hey really weird question will you guys <laughs> do a photo shoot with me on the roof I can't really explain why but I need a photo shoot done it's so weird I mean, what a better way to prepare you for the game, though, of asking perfect strangers to do something you want them to do. What is one winner of Survivor and one non-winner of Survivor that you feel you associate with the most, be it personally, strategically, what what have you? Yeah, so I definitely, um, maybe not like outwardly, but inwardly, I definitely relate to Natalie, um, mm. the winner of Blood vs. Water and um, who also played on uh, Winners at War. Um, just her determination and drive and like her, the fact that she was first on Exile Island and came all the way around and made it to the final three, the fact that she would give up her rewards to her alliances, like those things, just like being smart and being a good social player and also being a beast on the, on the, um, you know, challenge side of it. I definitely mm. relate to her a lot. Just like that inner strength and inner fire. I'm super, super competitive. And I, once I get my mindset on something, like it's over, like I will accomplish whatever is in front of me. I will tackle any mountain. and I'll literally do anything so I can win. Um, and then a player that I associate with like in another way, um, is Cody from <laughs> past from season 43 i mean listen i see you have some tattoos i will not ask about the area where his tattoo may have been and where that applies to you but no no butt cheek uh (laughs) tattoo here yet you know who knows but um just his like wanting to have fun so i feel like i have these like two different things inside of me i have this like really driven passionate like determined part of me and then this part of me that just like wants to have fun and like wants to make alliances wants to do well in the game but also just like enjoy every single moment and not take a moment for granted so and I feel like Cody definitely played in that way like just his ability to laugh about everything the way he you know got those beads from everyone that's something that I could pull off you know and people didn't even know they just thought he was being like funny Cody just like I hope people are just thinking oh she's just being Kendra like I really hope that people underestimate me because I'm happy-go-lucky you know but like a girl version yeah talk to me more about that how do you think or I guess in this case hope that people perceive you you know I can be, I've been told I'm intimidating. You know, I stand at around 5'10", I have broad shoulders, I am confident. I definitely walk into a room with purpose. I hold myself very like high Um, and I have a big personality. So I take up a lot of space, but I'm hoping that I'm also really goofy. I was class clown, elementary school, middle school, high school, was a stand-up comedian, like, I'm always trying to do something to make people laugh. And so I'm hoping that like my goofiness and just lightheartedness and like ability to make literally anything into a joke, like kind of like takes that off. So I hope, and I'm like a spiritual woo girl, you know, like Mm. I freaking love astrology. I'm wearing coyote teeth on my earrings. Like wondering what those were. (laughs) Like I have all these tattoos. I kind of just like have crazy hair and just, you know, whatever. I can also pretty much recite any rap song that you throw my way. So I am a lot in one and I hope that I'm just, I hope that people don't see like the competitive, like intimidation, intimidative, intimidate, intimidating 
part of me and see more of this like I'm trying to give off like more of this like oh like love it all, happy go lucky I love to travel like astrology like I'm trying to play not as like aware and observant as I am but also still be myself because like that is still myself but right try not to be so like serious because I am just so determined and I want to win literally so bad I can't even I've never wanted anything more in my life so when it comes to the other players in the game that may be obstacles to get you to that goal what do you seek out in an alliance partner are you seeking similar qualities than you were different ones you know um who who knows I become friends with so many different types of people that it's just really gonna depend on like that in turn like that like chemistry um I would love to be you know ha- find this kind of partner in crime that's kind of like fun like me but also I tend to like because I'm so extroverted and outgoing whatever I also tend to attract like more introverted people and more mm-hmm. like quiet calm people so I'd love to have like an alliance I would love to go to the end with like two pals like with two people who I'm like literally from the gen genuinely the bottom of my heart like I would be happy for any of us to win like I really hope that's the case obviously I'm an optimist I'm a dreamer probably unlikely but not impossible so you know um yeah having somebody a little bit more grounded because I can tend to I'm very emotional I you know feel everything really big so I feel like my answer to this question is to find a partner who's like grounded and calm and can kind of like take me down a level and be like this is reality what you're saying is not reality you know but Uh also who trust me because I do get these really strong gut instincts and somebody who sees and values that you know Mm. so when it comes to like the actual flesh and blood people that you are sitting with that you're checking out right now at Ponderosa talk to me about some of those first impressions are there people right now that you are making that eye contact with and saying like yes I can work with you if we draw the same buff perfect and then there are people that you're thinking big red flag I'm writing down your name on the parchment as soon as possible Yeah. So it's funny because I haven't gotten huge red flags like right away, but as the days go on, I've kind of seen a little bit more. It's funny because some of the more extroverted people like myself, I'm kind of keeping more of an eye on because like, I don't know, I can just read people. I'm like, Hmm, I kind of need to keep an eye on you a little bit more, but there are definitely more so people that I like feel like I've made eye contact with who I feel like they feel the same way. Like, I got you, girl. You know, like, I got you. Like, I feel like there's a vibe between a couple of us. And um, I could just be thinking that because I'm just like, who doesn't want to work with me? But, (laughs) um, and I'm sure there's people who are like, that girl with the crazy curly hair and the fucking teeth earrings, like, she seems weird um which I am and yeah there's there's vibes there's definitely Mm. vibes (laughs) well let me test those vibes a bit I'm going to put a scenario in front of you so let's say you're in the pre-merge you're on your camp beach boat comes your way and you hear you have to send one person on a journey now we've seen these past few seasons the good and bad that can come with those are you volunteering to go are you trying to push someone else to do it what's your strategy for that I am a diplomat and I love fairness. I'm a Libra. Um, so my vote is no matter what people say, I'm going to say we pull sticks or pull rocks um, for who goes. Um, and then if somebody resists that, I'm going to let them go and I'm going to use it against them. Interesting. When it comes to your handling of advantages in general, does that differ a bit? Are you no longer the diplomat when you're on your own, you know, hunting through trees for idols? Yeah, I actually like took a nap today and sort of, like envisioned me in another person, me being like, okay, I really want to go look for idols. I'm going to bring somebody with me um, and be like, no, we're just going to go on a walk. We're not looking for idols. Then me being like, we're looking for fucking idols. And then like, like somebody who I'm obviously like in with already, but um, for the most part, like my gut instinct going into this is I'm going to keep that quiet. You know, I don't want to 
I'm, I'm kind of, oh, it'd be so cool to find an idol, but like not really care that much, but just kind of be like, that would be amazing as if it's like a far-fetched dream, but I know that I'm going to find an idol because that's just who I am. Like I'm, I'm also I'm lucky, but I'm a little lucky, you know? So I, I love that. Well, let me present one more scenario to you to finish okay. things off. I love these. If, if you could bring a celebrity or a fictional character out as your loved one for a loved one's visit, who are you picking and why? It's so hard. Oh, man. Okay. A celebrity or a freaking fictional character. <laughs> oh my God. This is a hard question. Um, There's so many people running through my brain right now, but I'm going to go with fictional character. I'm going to say Hagrid from Harry Potter. <laughs> I mean, you could compare volume of hair, right? Like you could share hair care secrets. <laughs> that makes sense. Pretty tall. There you go. I, I just love Harry Potter and like, I'm such a Harry Potter nerd. And that was like one of the first like fictional characters that came to my mind. So we'll just go with that. Cause like, I'm not going to be not soaked for, even though it'd be like a little hot for him. So maybe not Hagrid. I wouldn't want him to be uncomfortable. Oh, he'd only be um, there for a short portion of time. Yeah. If we have to do like water challenges, like he can basically just carry me above his head and walk through all the water. Cause he's part giant. 